All right, we are live. It's always exciting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our intern deep dive showcase for Downey Unified School District. I am June Bea, CEO of Bea Group, and we have been so fortunate to be partners with the Downey Unified School District for a number of years now. And this is actually our sixth time that we have run a paid internship. This is our second year of a virtual internship. And I wanted to just acknowledge that they are an amazing partner. We are so fortunate to work with with everyone at the Downey Unified School District. This one is documentary filmmaking. So welcome to our documentary filmmaking deep dive. So the internship is six weeks. We have interns who are all rising seniors and they have applied and interviewed and have participated with us for the last six weeks. This is the final showcase that they are sharing the documentary film that they made in only four weeks. And so I wanted to just uh, welcome you all. I'm gonna turn it over to board member, Nancy Swenson from the Downey Unified School District. So hi, Nancy, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all. Um, again, I've been to a couple of these already. Um, I've been to these for the past few years. And actually, I kind of like the virtual. It's got a nice plus to it because I get to see everybody's stuff as opposed to when we're out in a presentation mode out in, you know, um, over by City Hall and things like that where we've been in the past. But um, this is really a nice way to do this. So, you know, sometimes there's a bonus. Um, but anyways, thanks everybody for all the work that you've done. Um, this is a great opportunity. Not, not many school districts do this. So um, I hope you all had a good time and, and you got a nice takeaway from all of your individual projects. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. We so appreciate all the board support and everybody at the district. And actually, this is my segue to our other awesome collaborative partner who just joined us is uh, John Harris. So I'm going to put John on the spot. John, are you in a space where you can share because Nancy just hey. spoke. <laughs> I am. Are you there? Yep. Hi, Can you John. Hear me? Yep. Hi. So we. Well, it's really wonderful to uh, join each of these showcases uh, celebrating the learning that our students have experienced over the last six weeks under the direction of the deep dive leads. And uh, I always look forward, uh, honestly, to this deep dive in uh, documentary filmmaking. And um, I'm sure all of the interns have had just a wonderful experience with uh, Barbarella Focos, um, a documentary filmmaker that has done a number of films for us. And so you were, uh, you were under uh, great guidance uh, during this last uh, six weeks. And we just can't wait to see uh, what it is that you've worked on in your projects. Uh, thank you to Barb, but thank you to, to uh, Bea, um, the Bea group as well. And uh, I, I always am sure to make sure to recognize that none of this would be possible without the support of our uh, Board of Education. And um, in times uh, during the pandemic when many other school districts canceled their internships, our Board of Education had the uh, forward vision of uh, pivoting in the pandemic. And so we ended up in a situation like this where people from all over the world are coming together in order to support the learning of our students in this really remarkable uh, internship. And for that, we are very, very grateful to the board for having that vision and moving us uh, forward and providing this wonderful experience, which is quite different from the classroom during the school year. So we are really thrilled that, uh, that you've had this experience in the last six weeks, and we can't wait to see what you've done. Thanks, John. So without further ado, I want to introduce our deep dive lead, Barbarella Focus. Hi, Barb. Hi, June. Uh, thank you so much for that, John. I really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, June. And actually, uh, in this deep dive on the film, all the interns here only had four weeks from start to finish. Uh, so for those of you watching on YouTube, I'm Barbarella Focus, co-owner of Salt and Sugar Productions, which specializes in documentary film. Most of these interns, who I like to call my docklings, <laughs> had no filming or editing experience before this deep dive. Some did, but most of them did not. What you're about to see is their one-person productions. They came up with their own concepts, 
wrote and narrated or conducted interviews. Um, uh, they filmed and they edited and editing involves filming or finding supportive footage like B-roll, as well as sourcing music, creating credits, titles, and lower thirds. As with many film festivals, I've broken them into some major themes, new Americans, variety, and family member stories. Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce them, and then they are going to introduce their film. Feel free to comment throughout in the comments, but we're going to save Q&A for the end. So I just wanted you to know that, as you see, they all worked very hard and their films are as unique and as wonderful as they are. I want to thank you, June and Downey Unified for making this possible. And um, I'm so proud of you all. So we are going to begin with Matt. Now, Matt actually translated his interview from Tagalog. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you, Matt, and then I'll be ready to play your film. Hi, I'm Matt Melendrez. Um, I'm an incoming senior at Warren High School. Um, some interesting things that I find fabulous about this internship that I learned throughout the duration is that even though I had prior documentary filmmaking experience, it still had so much to offer to me, especially with editing and especially camera work. That's a huge thing that we got to learn in this documentary as well as other things like B-roll. Um, so practically the documentary that I chose to film was about my father Rizal. Um, I did not know much about my father. We never had long talks or anything before this documentary. And I found this is a great opportunity to open up uh, his past and to learn about my family's history. So I hope you enjoy the documentary. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. And here we go. Oops. Hang on. Ipinanganak ako sa Pagsangan Laguna sa big island ng Pilipinas. I'm so sorry. I hit share and then I went to make it big screen and it went small. So that's our first glitch. One more time. The right way. Ipinanganak ako sa Pagsangan Laguna uh, sa big island ng Pilipinas, which is, they call it Luzon. Ang buhay ko during the time ng ako'y lumalaki ay uh, isang ordinaryo o mahirap lamang. At the age of seven, ay nagkumpasa na ako magtagbaro. Uh, ako nag-nalilinis, uh, nag, uh, nagpapakain ng baboy at mga at ang kapalit noon ay ang aming bigas para sa buwan-buwan ng bigas namin para pigili sa amin ng aking alumni. Uh, naging working student ako at isang time para lang matapos kong pag-aaral. Kaya yan ang aking mga pangaral sa aking mga anak na ang magbabago ng buhay mo ay sa, pag sa edukasyon lang. Nanalo akong konsyal at nag-full-time na lang akong konsyal sa Pilipinas. Ang una kong ipinangako sa mga aking mga constituent ay hindi ako tatanag na sweldo, ibabalik ko sa pagpapaaral ng mga bata. Kaya nagtayo ako ng aking foundation, uh, foundation kailangan pa lang maging korak ka para para mag-sustain mo yung 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 buhay politika mo sa Pilipinas. Kailangan magnako pa. Pero hindi ko kayang gawin yun. Hindi kaya ng konsensya ko ang magnakaw. Ayoko ang ipakatain ko sa mga anak ko ay galing sa nakaw. Kaya naisipan ko ng Uh, hindi ko na tinapos ang termino ko as a consular. Nag-apply ako ng uh, tourist visa sa Amerika at doon ako uh, nag-migrate ako sa Amerika. Kasama ko ang aking dalawa na lalaki. Nung magang ma namatay ang aking ama, and namatay ang ama ko dahil uh, hindi sa sakit kasi nabaril ang aking ama. And it's all about politics. 
Kasi yun ang common sa Pilipinas kapag kakalaban ka sa politika. Naging positive ang aking pag, pag, uh, pagtingin sa nangyari sa buhay ko kung mawala ang aking. Kasi naging more stable ako, more naging uh, family oriented. Gusto kong ikita sa mga anak ko from day one na pinangalak sila at sila lumaki sila, nandito yung kanilang father figure na tinitig na sumasabi. So, naging security ako, tapos nagtrabaho ko sa isang uh, payment processing center sa uh, LA. Ako ay na-assign sa isa sa mail room. Doon tumulo ang luha ko ng nagsasalansan ako ng maraming kahon-kahon na sulat ang sinasalansan ko na hindi ko man ang ginawa during the time nung ako ay nasa, nasa Pilipinas kasi siyempre nakarating na ako ng magandang magandang posisyon, naging manager na ako and then hindi ko na-expect na darating ako sa Amerika bababa ang aking klase uh, ng trabaho ko. But hindi ko pinagsisihan dahil dumating sa akin ang mga anak ko, uh, nag-enjoy ako, uh, dito ko nakita ang ang precious ng family funding. Kasi kung inahalin tulad ko sa Pilipinas at saka sa Amerika, mas masarap mamuhay sa Amerika kasi ang family bonding maganda. Uh, kahit ako naman nung dito lang matanda na ako, pero may pangarap pa rin ako. I don't, hindi ko tinitigil ang pangarap ko kasi ayaw kong tumigil as much as possible. Kailangan ng gusto ko marating ko yung pinakapules ng aking kakayanan sa mundong ito na pwede kong ipamana sa aking mga anak. Yun ang aking buhay. And then there's credits. Um, great job, Matt. Just like and and then please, as we continue, because questions and answers are going to be at the end. If you have thoughts as you're watching these, pop them into the comments, please, so people can see your feedback and maybe that you remember questions. Um, so uh, just fantastically done. Our next up is Mariah, and I have to say, let's see, I am not seeing that in my. Okay, is Mariah. And Mariah had never done any editing before at all. And so she not only uh, interviewed her family, but also translated from Spanish and created subtitles. So uh, Mariah. Hi, everybody. I'm Mariah Lima. I am going to be an incoming senior at Downey High School. And uh, what this internship has taught me is that um, there I can really take time to try new things and be myself. And uh, I really like the flexible schedule that I learned with this experience. And so the film that I will be presenting at this showcase is a story that um, was told by my grandma. And um, I felt like it really touched me that I felt like I needed to share to the rest of the world. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Mariah. All right, here we go. ¿Cuál fue tu motivo de venir a los Estados Unidos? El motivo principal era porque yo era una madre soltera. Tenía a cargo de dos hijos y quería un futuro mejor para ellos. Como poderle dar un estudio a ellos mejor del que ya tenían allá. Darle cosas materiales como juguetes, ropa, uh, todo lo que yo no pude tener de pequeña, poderles dar a ellos. Me sentí muy solo desde que llegué al primer momento que llegué al país, a Estados Unidos, porque los extrañaba mucho. Me dolió mucho dejarlos, pero pues pensé más en el que eh, el futuro de ellos, de que crecieran eh, 
en mejores, mejor país, con mejores oportunidades para poder superarse tanto en el estudio y materialmente. I was feeling sad. It's really confused to say the feelings that I had. I was little. I was about six years old. But I could say it was sad. It was a sad situation when she left to the U.S. How did you feel when your mom left for the U.S.? I was very sad. I was crying. I started adapting behaviors of a five-year-old. Creo que estaba muy joven para pensar en en lo que ellos iban a sentir o a sufrir, pero lo que sí sé es que la razón de emigrar a otro país fue para un mejor futuro para ellos. Creo solo pensé en eso. It was a really uh, emotional situation. Uh, when we reconnect, when we bond with my mother, again, for the first time, challenging as well. It took time to bond with her again. I felt like she was a stranger to me at first. I felt like I didn't know my mom anymore. Duró algún tiempo para que esa unión volviera a ser igual. Now that I'm older and I think about things better, I think, yeah, I think we all should pursue our dreams. And if that was one of her dreams, then yes. And, you know, her pursuing her dreams got me to pursue a higher education and to better myself. Great job, Mariah. Okay, it's fantastic. Moving right along. Next up, we have Janice. Janice, and I love this, this, this segment, New Americans, as you, you see the theme, there's, we have the Philippines, El Salvador. Next is Nicaragua represented with Janice, who did a great job sourcing uh, photography for this. So Janice, Hi, my name is Janice Eva, and I'm going to be a senior at Downey High School. Coming into this experience, I had little to no experience with filmmaking or editing, and I was just interested in learning more about it. And thanks to Barb, I got to, and everyone involved, I got to learn new things and improve my, film, my filmmaking, and I hope to improve in the future. I decided to make this film about my dad because I never really knew the full story on why he came to the United States and I was just really interested about it. Not only that, I've been staying here in Nicaragua for the past couple of days and I got to experience a lot of things that he talked about in this film. I hope you guys enjoy. That's awesome. I didn't know you're joining us all the way from Nicaragua now. Okay, well here we go. Nicaragua is in Central America, north of Costa Rica and south, south of Honduras. I went to school, I graduated from high school, went one year to college, but after the first year in college, I dropped and started working. I started driving trucks. How is it different than living here in the United States? I would say it was harder uh, because you don't have much opportunities, um, you know, like there's a lot of issues with, you know, the governments and stuff like that. So we don't have much money to spend. And uh, it's really hard. That's the reason why I dropped college, because my mom couldn't afford paying for um, school. So I had to drop and start working. And then I was the driver. The road was really bad. It was uh, only like, I would say, 100 miles. No, I'm sorry, less than that. Like 60 miles were pavement road. And after that, it was all dirt road. 
sometimes the rivers, uh, there were rivers that didn't have bridges and you will have to stay there until the levels of the water will go low so you can pass under the bridge or under the river to the other side. I had one big accident in August 1999. Um, the person that was with me actually died in the accident and his family believed that the accident was my fault. My family recommended me not to go back to work and just stay away from them. And my dad found out that that was happening, so he decided to bring me to the United States. It affected me, uh, like I would say the first days. After that, I mean, I realized that it was really not my fault. I tried to, I tried actually to stop the truck before it flip over many times but it was really hard. So, I mean, I realized that it was really not my fault. I tried my best to avoid it. You said the truck was rolling over. Where did you guys crash? Well, we were going up the hill and then on the way down, the brakes uh, fell. They fell and uh, we had a very heavy load. So on the way down, I was trying to stop the truck and there was no way to stop it. And going down the hill, I actually made my way to avoid two curbs, but uh, then on the third one, I couldn't stop the truck and it just flip over. All the load went to the side and the truck finally stopped on some trees. Do you think that coming here changed your life for the better or for the worse? No, definitely for the better. Since I didn't have experience here in the U.S., I started working I started driving, I'm sorry, as a bobtail driver, you know, a smaller truck, 24 foot truck. And then after like six months, I started driving uh, tractor trailers, 53 footers. And I drove for about two years. And then uh, the owners decided to bring me to the office to start um, training as a dispatcher. And that's what I did after that, 2008, 18, until present, I've been dispatching at Kelly Frey. Well, do you have any family here, or is it just you? Um, my dad, he was with me until 2014, I think, that he passed. Uh, then, I, of course, I have my family, uh, I have my wife, my two kids. 15 and 17 years old. Uh, we got married in 2003, and uh, that's my family right After now. After everything that you went through growing up and living here in the United States, are you happy? I'm happy. I'm very happy. Um, like I said, it's, 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 it's really hard for you to live in a country that doesn't give you much opportunities. So I definitely have been here in the United States. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be inspired by your story. Do you have any advice for your family? I would just say to for them to live their life at the fullest now. Live every day as it's the last day. Uh, enjoy it. Be good. Be better at what you do. Try your best and live your life as the fullest the fullest every day great job janice for having like virtually no experience there all right so uh, next step andrea had also never filmed or edited before um and did a great job with this interview and b-roll uh from scratch so andrea um, okay, so hi, I'm Andrea, uh, and I go to Downey. Um, one thing I've taken away from this is that as scary as it might be to ask for help, um, there are many people willing to like help you and be there for you um, and support you. Uh, and so I chose this documentary and to film my father because he's the one who's taught me resilience and perseverance, and I wanted to share his story. Um, and so, yeah. Wonderful. All right. And thank you for sharing it. And as here we go. Hey, 
No, there were and there were no expectations. All I knew was that uh, the goal was to come here, study, and go back home. That's what what my parents wanted. That's what you know the folks around me wanted. Well, college life was I want well, was something that I wanted, but due to financial hardships back home, I had to make sure that <clears throat> you know I had a place to stay. I had I had food to eat. So even though I was going to college, I started working part time. But then when I started seeing dollars and um, you know hardships with my family couldn't support my needs, the part time turned to become full time. And uh, after that, you know, it was uh, you know you had no choice. You know your grades were dropping. Uh, you know professors were not too happy. So instead of just going through the whole motion, I just quit. Never went back to school and started working. That's a lot of things that you go through your mind where you're thinking, "Hey, am I going to make it, or am I just going to return home as a failure?" Um, so those were the things, you know, where I was going to stay, who I was going to meet. So I learned the culture here, and you just got to adapt. If you're not adaptable to a change, then you tend to fail. Because here, it's like you know, you can if you have the right to express yourself. You have the right to, you know, be free. Um, whereas in India, you're really, you know, you just uh, gotta follow those cultural values, and uh, you know, uh, your family and your parents always have a say at the end of the day. Well, I wanted to study uh, business management. You gotta make sure your routine. You get up early in the morning. You walk down to the bus stand. You get in the bus and you go down and you study hard. You study and then uh, uh, you know once you're done, you get home like about I don't know six o'clock, seven o'clock on the bus, and then you walk back to your hotel. Uh, that's where I was staying in the beginning, and uh, yeah, that was a regular routine. You know, Monday through Friday. Uh, during the course of my um, school years, I met my friend Ali. We still keep in touch. Also, along that course, uh, I met Rose Auntie and Doc. Um, so she helped me a lot. You know, even times when I was struggling and had, was difficult to make ends meet. And John Eggley, who used to work with my dad, uh, you know, comes here quite often. So he was here during the time when I landed. Um, so he took me around. You know, gave me, um, showed me a place to stay down in Covina. Um, the five star in and then also I met I was able to meet with his uh, girlfriend uh, you know who gave me a very beautiful pair I still have that pair as a memory since I've landed in this country uh, my thought was completely different my thoughts changed obviously because you know I started interacting with a lot of people no hardest moment <clears throat> no hardest moment the only thing I just kind of felt that I was going to be lonely and then obviously I met my wife uh, Delia uh, she has been with me for all over 21, 22 years now. Like I said, uh, you know, no regrets, no remorse. I'm happy. I'm comfortable. All this will be loving, caring, forgiving. Um, like I said, you know, stay humble and stay hungry. You'd never think. But she'd never filmed or edited before. A lot of them. <laughs> Great job, Anjaya, with the B-roll and everything. So the, the the last one in this category of new Americans is Daniela. And uh, the cool thing about this is Daniela actually had a vacation with her family in Mexico and did filming while abroad and checking in from there. So Daniela. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Daniela Varela, and I'm also going to be a senior at Downey High School. And uh, what this documentary filmmaking deep dive really taught me is that everyone has everyone has different stories to tell and they're all unique and powerful in different ways. And what I learned about myself is that I really found documentary filmmaking to be really interesting, um, which I never would have thought to be like to make a short film on my own. Um, and I ended up really being passionate about it. And um, it was also a great experience to learn how to use an editing software for the first time. Um, and I'm really, you know, proud of all of us who were able to manage to get it done. And um, it was also an honor to work with Barb and, and with my peers because they were able to help me. 
And um, my short film was about my immigrant parents who came from Mexico. And the reason why I wanted to sh make a film about this was to show like the significance and the struggle and the pain that most immigrants go through, if not all of them. And um, so I really just wanted to capture that and have my parents' story as an example. So I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. And you said did such a beautiful job. I forgot that a lot of them even learned the software in the four weeks too. It's just insane. All right, here, here we go. I was raised in a, a town called Zapopan, Jalisco. I was like 15 when I got here in the United States. I got here two months before my 16th birthday. When I was about seven or eight years old. I started in elementary school. I grew up with my mom and uh, my dad will come visit us every two years. So he worked here and my mom worked in, in Mexico. My dad was really hard on us, on me, not all my brothers, but I wanted to be, I wanted to be somebody. So I wanted my family, my, my kids to have a better future, a better life. My parents didn't encourage me to go to college, right? My older, older brothers wanted me to uh, go to high school. I wanted to make money, you know, that's, that's, that's the dream of most people coming to this country, you know, most immigrants. I decided to start working when I was close to being uh, 60. It's not easy to work 10 hours a day to go to, go to school at night and work weekends. I cross illegally, you know, running, crossing the free, free, freeways running. I was really bad, you know, because the smugglers risk uh, the people's life trying to do that. Coyote are our people. They bring you over here illegally. They cross you through the desert, through the ocean, and not a lot of people make it. A lot of people die. He took me through a neighborhood where I, I was robbed by a gang. They were like three or four guys. They robbed me. I used another girl's um, birth certificate. Um, we were the same age, and my older sister, she knew that family, and they, they were okay with it. I mean, that was so nice of them, you know, because that's how I came over here, and my brother. I really didn't want to be here, you know. I, I said, I'm going to be here for one year and then go back to Mexico, but I kept staying and staying, and I what the sign and I never went back in a long time. I was little, I wasn't my choice. We came here um, because my brothers, my older brothers and sisters and my dad, they were already living over here. And it was just my mom and my two younger brothers and myself. So my mom decided that we should um, come and live over here so we can be all together. My mom, she had a cross with a coyote. She was running and she fell. My brother, he came back to help her and she like, just let them go. She couldn't keep up with them because they were running. And somehow they made it. It's, it's hard to come to this country as an immigrant because you know, you really uh, struggle more than, than the people that is born in this country. As an immigrant, it's, it's always harder. When you're an immigrant and coming to a foreign country, you know, you have to be a, a hardworking person too, you know, because you gotta show the world what you're capable of doing. Our people is well known for being hardworking people, you know, and it's a positive thing for the, for the community. You know, almost 40 years since I left Mexico. Yeah, I'm proud of being Mexican. Anybody should be proud of where they're from, you know, and not putting other people down just because you're from a different country. Usually, you know, when you're a minority or an immigrant, you start from the bottom and uh, you work your way up. But that's what makes you grow at, at the same time. And it makes you value um, everything that you have. Uh, if, if you have a dream, you know, you can just fight for it, you know, become what you want. You keep uh, fighting for your dreams. Never keep up. My name is Eva Varela. I was born in Jalpa, Zacatecas, Mexico. My name is uh, Israel Varela. I'm 52 years old. I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico. Just absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm just, I'm tearing up just how awesome all of these are <laughs> it's just you did such a great job oh uh, so that was the the one category everybody rocked it i know now we are going to switch it up just a little 
for uh, a variety uh, category. And uh, beginning with Faith, I want to say that Faith uh, wrote her narration and narrated it. And Faith, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your film. Hi, I'm Faith Newell and I'm going to be a senior at Warren High School. And coming into this with no film experience, what I learned is that if I worked hard towards something that is gonna come out to the best of my ability because I put effort towards it and it's only gonna get better from there. And my film is on my four month old puppy um, and it's gonna be the reality behind it. and behind the scenes of what people don't see. And I chose this because I read an article about how people were adopting puppies during quarantine, but now they're returning them to the shelters because they can't see them. So I wanted to inform people that having a puppy isn't always fun, but they can be, and they're actually hard work. Great, thanks so much, babe. Yeah, and this is just a fun one. I, like when we needed a puppy break, this was like the one to watch in between. Okay, here we go. I've always wanted my own puppy ever since I was a little girl. So when I bought my puppy Cash, I was so excited. Little did I know that excitement would quickly fade when I realized I wasn't prepared for this commitment I've gotten myself into. There's just some things I wish I would have known before I brought Cash into my life. Firstly, I wish I would have known that sometimes he cries all night. Then after a long night of crying, he wakes up early in the morning to cry some more. I wish I would have known that my puppy's definition of playing isn't catch, but biting my fingers and chasing my toes. I wish I would have known that my puppy hates to be petted and cuddled, but rather bite my hands and run around instead. I wish I would have known that I will wake up every morning to the gift of an awful smelling room of pee and poop that I now had to clean up. I wish I would have known how much energy he had and how much attention he would need. I wish I would have known that the YouTube videos are lies and training your puppy isn't as easy as they make it seem. Lastly, I wish I would have known how much time and patience I would need in order to raise this puppy. I do wish I was better prepared to take on this everyday task of raising cash, but I now know no matter how many frustrating days, he still manages to bring a smile on my face. I now know no matter what he does, I will always love him unconditionally. Right. I mean, come on. That's just a whole lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> so um, next up, so, and then there's a variety you're going to see. They're all different sorts. Um, uh, next up is Levy. And I, I really appreciated the one-on-one -on -one conversations that I got to have with Levy as we like, you know, as he game planned how to really uh, approach this topic. So Levy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yours? Um, hello, my name is Levy Guerrero. I am currently going to be an incoming senior at Warren High School. And I just want to start off by saying it was a huge honor and pleasure being able to work with Ms. Barb. And something that uh, I'm going to take from this internship and from what I learned was um, interviewing because it was something that I was eager to learn. And the tips that she gave me were very helpful. And um, this film, I chose this film um, because I thought it was interesting to see the perspective, two different perspectives based on religion and Christianity, which is specifically in this point. And, um, well, and, and someone that isn't 100% sure on what they believe or disbelief. And that's all. Okay, great. Thanks, Levy.
En el transcurso de este rapto, lo que va a suceder en este mundo, que mucha gente se va a quedar desesperada, preguntándose qué pasó, qué está sucediendo. ¿Por qué? Porque muchos van a ver que van a desaparecer. Va a estar las personas, un familiar, un hijo, un hermano, los bebés, todos van a estar, si estaban en Cristo y estaban sirviéndole a Cristo, van a ser levantados con él. Pero este mundo va a quedar destruido. I think it's not reality because humans and life has been going on for centuries, for decades, for years, whatever. And I feel like it's just not something that, it, I feel like if it would have happened, it would, um, if it were to happen, it would have happened a long time ago. El rapto sucede primero y, y, y los que estén en Cristo Jesús van a ser tomados. Ese es el rapto, el levantamiento de la iglesia que viene Jesucristo por su novia. But then again, didn't God create everything? If, uh, you know, and um, isn't everyone supposed to be his children? And like, you know, because he created them. But why only take the ones who still believe in him or like believe in him? and leave the ones who don't. ¿Qué le diría a una persona incrédula que no cree en Cristo Jesús? Le diría, arrepiéntete, entrega el corazón a Cristo y deja que el Señor cambie tus pensamientos. Porque la religión nos salva y personas que no han creído a Cristo, cómo se mantienen vivos y Dios es el que te provee el aire, Él es el que te proveyó la vida, Él es el que te mantiene aquí en tierra firme. Cómo no creer en un Dios de poder, cómo no creer en un Dios de salvación. Que se arrepienta y comience a caminar en el Señor y va a conocer cosas hermosas en el Señor y va a vivir para el Señor. That's not entirely true because just because you don't believe in a certain religion doesn't mean you're going to hell. You could be a good person for all they know, like in the world and stuff, but just because of that particular part, you're going to go to hell. I don't think that. Y que todavía es tiempo para que la humanidad se arrepienta porque tiene vida, porque hay oportunidad de salvación. Mientras nosotros tenemos vida, está la oportunidad. Que deje de estar en el viejo hombre y se venga a los pies de Cristo. Cari pecado de la Great job, Levy. I forgot that you also did the translation and subtitles, which is just extra work on top of work. Um, uh, so, all right, this next one, I will say that Alyssa came in knowing right away what she wanted to do, and she was excited about it and did a lot, had hours of interview <laughs> and, and really pulled it off. So Alyssa, why don't you, why don't you say a few words? Hello, my name is Alyssa de la Cerda. I'm a rising senior at Downey High School and I just want to start off by saying thank you again to Barbarella and to Cassandra and to all the people that are here. You guys are amazing. Thank you guys for helping me out with this film in any way that you could. As many of you know, I came in knowing absolutely nothing about making films and it was one of the funnest months that I've had in the past year and a half. And if there's anything that I am going to take away from this experience, it would be just appreciation. I think I have a new appreciation for film, the amount of time, the intricacy that goes into the art that is film and the artists that are filmmakers, because I mean, this took weeks to create and it's five minutes long. So I just have this like, it's just amazing um, what people create. And I feel like these stories that we are all sharing are very important to share. And with this power, I feel like I was given, I wanted to tell the story that I hold, um, not story, but experience and topic that I hold very close to my heart, which is mental health. It's something that I've struggled with a lot. And I felt like I was alone in my struggle, but through this documentary and through my interviews, I realized that I wasn't. And I think it's a very powerful story that needs to be shared. So thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. God, you're gonna make me cry before I even play it. I just need to, all right, here we go. Great job for never having done this before. <laughs> Okay, so go ahead and describe for me to the best of your ability what you remember from March 13th of 2020. 
Tonight, Los Angeles County, where 10 million people live, has declared a public health emergency. I remember waking up being super stressed out because over the past month, COVID had reached California. I remember our principal going onto the intercom, basically like kicking us out of campus. The day we got released for COVID, I was kind of excited to have like two weeks off, you know, because that's what they advertise. I remember going to school that day and I was like, dude, I don't want to do anything. Like it's Friday. I just want to get to the weekend already. I want them to cancel school. I was thinking I want them to cancel school. I went from talking to everybody all day totally being at home on my own 24 7. school became really draining because it was just straight up homework and zoom calls really felt like a self-teaching year i was doing at least 10 hours of homework a night and that was like aside from the multiple hours of zoom we did there was times where i straight up would skip a meal to like sit through and do more homework i, I didn't build a relationship with any of my teachers this year i think the best way i could describe it is it literally felt like i was in prison how many times do you feel like you cried or had mental breakdowns at least like five, six times, at least. I dug myself into this pit where I didn't really do much. I only talked to the same five people a day. I wouldn't try to leave that area of comfort just because doing the same thing over and over was so much easier than having to try and get a semblance of my old life back because it kind of just hurt too much to think about knowing that that was stripped away from me. I would pretty much look at a screen like for at least 16 hours a day. I had people that I could go to, but I chose not to go to people because I didn't want to put my problems to someone else's hands. There were times where I was just like, dude, I can't take it anymore. There, I remember one time in specific, I was literally just chilling in bed and I felt tears coming down my face because I was just looking up at the ceiling. I wasn't doing anything. And uh, I just broke down. I couldn't. I, just, I, did, I, didn't know, I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know how to stop it. I was just... I had a lot of nights where I was just like, I was on the verge of just giving up. I'd be lying if I said I was as like happy as I was when I was a sophomore. We were still in school. I'm terrified for next year. My work ethic just doesn't exist anymore. And I feel like I became really introspective over COVID just because I know myself better now. I feel like I lost myself a little. It's just that feeling of like, you know you're not alone. Like mentally you're not alone, but physically you feel so alone because there's no one around you. Because physically, like there's just times where I need a hug. I remember like the first time I met up with my friends, I was like, I forgot how to carry like a normal conversation because I haven't done this in so long. I wasn't really able to experience all those high school memories everyone talks about, you know? Why not? I didn't want to, or I just didn't actively try to. Um, I guess to a certain extent, I thought that I was better than that. Having my friends around and always hanging out with them was definitely a mental escape from my reality. Enjoy high school. Like, enjoy the little things. Enjoy every single part of high school. The good, the bad, the weird, the annoying. Enjoy it all. Great job, Alyssa. Okay, so next up, okay, this one I love. This is Isaac A. And uh, I just want to say that like, I mean, it's expert use of B-roll. So Isaac narrated, uh, wrote, narrated, sourced all of the, all of the stuff here. And it's just a pro, pro B-roll. So um, uh, Isaac, go ahead, say hi. Hello, my name is Isaac Ariola. And I'm a rising senior at Warren High School, and thank you, Barb, for saying that, even though I didn't, well, I don't really have any experience in film, so this was very, like, I really got to shine and just give it all my best, and so, yeah, what I learned from Barb was how music can really affect um, the way someone feels, and it really sets the mood, so I really wanted to nail that when I was doing my film, and I also learned from Barb about the Ken Burns effect, which I, I see in a lot of videos and I didn't really know that it had a name. And it's, it's the panning and zooming effect that's used in video production. Uh, anyways, what I, I chose to do my documentary on the history of heels because I personally think that it's underrated and um, I really wanted to use this opportunity uh, to uncover the origins of 
heals and like through a historical lens while also understanding how gender and power plays a role in heals. Well said, Isaac. Okay, I can't believe that you didn't do I B-roll before, so then I'm doubly impressed or forgot. Wow, okay, here we go. H E E L S heels, a staple in women's fashion. A pair of tricky shoes responsible for making women wobble around eventually lead to their downfall as they murmur to themselves, beauty is pain. A type of footwear that is dominantly worn by women, yet originally made and worn by men. When did such a grand gender swap like this ever occur? It was the Persians in the 10th century who made the discovery that shoes with a heel could help horseback riders keep their feet on stirrups. By the 17th century, Persian riders began to wear heeled shoes with and without their horses. Since horses were a sign of wealth, heeled shoes came to represent money and power. Through trade and foreign affairs, the heel began to spread. European aristocrats began to adopt this trend and incorporate the heel into fashion. Most notably, King Louis XIV, who wore thick red heels for the purpose of elevating his noble status, rather than wanting to appear quote unquote feminine. It was exhausting and burdensome for men to walk in heels, so wearing them conveyed to others that this heel-wearing man was too important to get up. Other people did the walking for him as they keenly attended to his needs. It's also important to note that during this time, women began to adopt men's fashion, which included high heels. It wasn't until the 18th century or the age of the Enlightenment and heels slowly began to go out of fashion for two reasons. One, due to the impracticality of walking in heels, men stopped wearing them. Two, as a result of the French Revolution, aristocrats decided to reject extravaganza and sport a more simple look to not only spare their poor feet, but their heads as well. Fast forward to the 19th century with the invention of the camera, heels made a comeback as they were worn by women in erotic photographs. But it wasn't until World War II that pinup girls began to wear slim, pointy heels in war posters. In the 1950s, Hollywood starlets like Marilyn Monroe popularized stiletto heels, which to this day are associated with feminine charm, sexuality, and power. Then, 182 years later, in the 1970s, men started to wear heeled shoes again. This time with the giant platform soles, instead of thin and sinuous heels that became synonymous with femininity. Over the years and decades, heels have enabled women to not only appear attractive, but powerful. Society has molded this idea that a block or a single stick on a shoe is an expression of power for both genders. Yet the true question lies in the sturdy heel itself. Should power be gendered? That's great. And all the music, look at that. And you did such a great job balancing it. Okay. All right, well done. We are now entering our next category, our next and final category. This is family member stories, or really this is interviewing a family member about something personal. Um, uh, we are going to begin with Paul, who does have filmmaking experience, and, and as you'll see. So Paul, why don't you say hello? Hello, um, my name is Paul Posadas. I am 
upcoming senior at Warren High. Um, so my experience with um, the whole internship was that, oh, sorry. So, in, um, so coming into the internship, I am, I am and was a working cinematographer, camera operator, and steady cam operator. So my, um, my storytelling comes from um, equipment and visuals. So going into here, I have surprisingly have had little experience bringing out story within story within uh, interview within words. Though that's that's something I've always um, hired it, an editor for. Never had to kind of put myself through this, but uh, Barb really gave me all this motivation to push through and create such a like have so much motivation to make such an amazing story. And coming out from filming this interview, I was able to um, work on myself to bring up this and blend this amazing story that came to be. Um, so about the film is that I, um, well, the film is an, on an honor to a man that um, put his life on the line for his country. Thank you, Paul. All right, I'll go ahead and share it. My name is Paul Posadas. I was enlisted active duty in the Army, out the rank of E6, which is Staff Sergeant, and I'm a Purple Heart recipient. Yes, I do. I feel it's 
Unfortunately, we do have losses in the military of all branches. If I could say anything about them or to them directly, you were never forgotten. You are always on everybody's mind and you paid the ultimate price, which was your life. God bless you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I didn't mean to cover the name there at the end. All right, well done. Um, uh, next up, we have Isaac, who also interviewed his father and uh, just about, about dreams and ins inspiration. So Isaac, tell us a little bit more. Introduce yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Isaac Williams. I'm a future senior at Downey High School. Um, Coming here to this internship, I think really benefited me. I learned a lot about um, about filmmaking and doing documentaries and it was, it was really fun overall. Um, I loved interviewing my dad and not really, not much of learning something new, but just um, learning about the process um, that he took in becoming a film director, which is what my documentary is about. My dad becoming a film director, um, kind of starting from the bottom in a very hard industry that is very lucky, um, or luck involved, I should say. But um, hope you all enjoy. Thanks, Isaac. Okay, here we go. I have always enjoyed storytelling. I love storytelling. I love creating, writing stories. And there's a certain magic, magical connection you have with an audience when you can bring that to the forefront. In 2012, uh, went to School of Las Vegas, Art Institute of Las Vegas. It's kind of a funny story to think about it now. I went to that school on kind of a dare. Someone dared me whether I could be a better storyteller than a professional filmmaker. And I swore that, yes, I probably could be. <laughs> you don't need a budget to make a good story. But I don't think that budget can ever, it can, yeah, it can definitely dictate the outcome of the type of story you're going to tell, but it won't have any outcome of whether the story is good. That's up to the writer and the director. No matter what challenges happen, I think, I don't know if there's anything I can ever convince me about that story. So Gunrun was my first feature, both for myself and it was my first feature altogether. I had dabbled, I had been on film sets of feature films, but never from start to finish of it. I was still learning techniques, I was still learning myself, and I hadn't quite found a groove for my own style. And I wanted my movies to have that uniqueness where people could sit back and go, oh, that's a job for 
ever been afraid of of all of this like your company everything like kind of failing afraid of failing i think that fear is inside of any person who creates the nagging voice in your head of are you sure you're really ready for this you know but that doesn't drive me right i feel it but it doesn't control my decisions i think if you were to ask me that question when i was 20 years old i'd have a very different answer now now i've been constantly writing year after year after year after year after year more and more stories to where now i say you know what it may not be everyone's favorite but there's going to be somebody that likes this story taking the audience on a journey right if they're afraid or you know they contemplate themselves or, or their, their situation in life or even their friends or whatever you know the movie or a story whether it's in book format or film, it makes you feel like you're a part of that journey emotionally. That's that's when it's that's when I feel like, yep, that's this is it. This is where it should be. Great job, Isaac. Your dad will be proud. Love that B-roll. Okay, so. Next up, we have Elizabeth, who did a lot of iterations, and this is a powerful story. You kind of like switched up the different things uh, you're going to do and landed on something I think that's awesome. So why don't you uh, say hi, Elizabeth? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Gallegos. I go to Warren High School. This internship taught me a lot of things, such as how to film an interview, how to film B-roll, how to edit, and ultimately how to create a project within a short time of four weeks. Um, at the end of the day, I decided to make a documentary about my mom because I find her story really, really inspiring and I thought it was time to share it with the world. Oh, I'm glad that you decided to. And I'm glad that your, that your mother decided to share too. Here we go. My interest in social work actually came about in a, in a really I guess dramatic or traumatic way. I was an office assistant at a high school. We had a parent come into the office and the parents spoke with the principal. And what she explained to us is that her daughter, which was one of our students, was being stalked by her ex-boyfriend, who was also one of our students. We walked her through the different ways that we would take in the school in order to keep her daughter safe. It was lunchtime. Our female student went outside to lunch. I decided to leave campus. I got a phone call from my office staff asking me how they can ring the bell to end lunch early. I was very confused. So I made a U-turn and I went back into the school. I ran inside. All of the school students were huddled in the middle of the campus. And I ran to the principal. She told me, ring the bell, ring the bell. Once the students dispersed, I looked down on the floor and that young lady was on the floor, she had been stuck. And the young lady ended up dying at the hospital about five hours later. The next three months after that is what led me to social work. We had every single mental health professional from LAUSD on our campus because all of our students were distraught. And so what the district did was that they dispatched 50 social workers became very interested in their work because I saw the pain in these kids. And that's when I decided that I was going to apply to become to be a social worker. When I read the Kelsey Dominguez Hills program and how they used a specific theory that isn't used in every social work program, that's when I knew that that was the program I wanted to go to. Grad school is at a whole nother level, a whole nother level. You have to read every night, you're writing every night, you're being challenged in the classroom, you have to make sure you walk and prepare. This wasn't a joke. It wasn't a joke. And I had everything hanging by a thread. I'm a mother with two children, I'm a wife, I, I'm, I'm still working part time in order to have money. And at the same time, I was grieving my dad. I was not, I, I feel like I had lost a piece of me. It was just so overwhelming that month two, I wrote to my teacher that I was dropping out of grad school. I went to class after I emailed him 
thinking this was my last class. This professor took me aside. He said, I've only known you for two months. He said, I don't know very much about you except the interactions that we've had here. But some people, you they wear their heart on their sleeves and you can see when they're trying to do good in the world. And you're one of those people. Now, if I knew you couldn't do it, if I read your papers and thought she can't read or write, she's not a good writer, she can't research. If I just thought you were gonna be one of the worst social workers out there, you weren't gonna help anyone, I would have said to you, hey, Marilyn, go ahead and do what you need to. But I'm here to tell you, please don't drop out. Please give it two more months. Just try a little bit harder. I understand you're grieving and it's okay to grieve but sometimes you have to learn how to balance both out. You have to regulate your emotions. This is what social work is about. So I said, okay, I'll give it two more months. Because at that point, I felt like, okay, the teacher said that maybe I could do it. I made friends around me. And I think two months later, I was just thriving. I was still grieving my dad. I was still crying. I was still struggling in many, many ways, but I was happier because I had changed my mindset. I had made this decision that I was gonna push through. I didn't want another thing in my life to feel unfinished. Part of what we do as social workers is helping people identify that the different parts of their own self that fulfill them and then what life adds on to that. So my life is fulfilled by my own, I fulfill my own needs in life. And my job fulfills that part of me that wants to provide a service to the world. Great job, Elizabeth. Your mom seems super cool. Like I would hang out with her. Um, uh, okay, so we just were down to the last three. So we have Denise, uh, who this is really cool. I think you're the only one who actually filmed reenactment, which is which is kind of cool for a couple parts in here. Uh, Denise, say hi. Hi, I'm Denise Rodriguez, and I go to Downey High School. Something I learned throughout this internship is that I'm, I, was, I am very dedicated. Um, I was very dedicated to perfecting my film, even when it was my first time using an editing software. So I want to thank Barb and everyone who helped me complete my documentary. I chose to do a film on my sister's work as an ABA therapist. In other words, an applied analysis th therapist. Um, her job really interested me because it truly makes a difference in children's lives and helps support them through everyday challenges. Thanks, Denise. Okay, here we go. My name is Stacy Rodriguez Broken. I wasn't really interested in kids at all. So it was a challenge and something new to try. Now that I've, done, I've been doing this for about two years, two years and a half maybe, I have decided to stay as an ABA therapist because I like helping little, working and helping little kids to meet and families. I learned about myself that I really like working with kids, especially helping kids with um, disabilities. I like helping the parents and families to uh, teaching them new ways on how to discipline and how to interact along with communicate with their children. Some challenges I came across with working with kids with disabilities were um, kids that were aggressive. Sometimes I just I just didn't know what to do. But along with more experience and as I've worked more with kids with aggression, I've learned how to interact with them and how to not really discipline them. Just teach them what better ways they can use as coping mechanisms when they're, they feel certain types of way and direct them to something healthy. For example, um, during a tantrum, kids could become aggressive and we can show them and we show them new coping mechanisms as they're like hugging a pillow, talking about it, um, using their words instead of hitting or screaming, which takes a lot of practice. So every time I get assigned a new client, I always have to analyze them very quickly if I want to build a, a bond within the first session with them because I have to gain their trust. So like, for example, I could have a 
small little boy that's into cars or dinosaurs. So I just get one of his toys and I start playing with him by myself. And then I ask if he wants to join or I try engaging with him in whatever he's doing. And you just have to try different methods with them because every kid is different. For another example, if they're older and I see posters on the wall or something, or I hear them talking about something they like, I bring it up and I show them that we do have something in common and I, I'm someone they can trust. So for every client, all the sessions are very different, but it can vary from having um, routines and sticking and showing them how to have a routine or just daily living things and can teach them how to tie the shoes, just everyday living things I show them. And also correcting their behavior because I specialize in their behavior. I realized that I do have patience, a lot of patience, and that there's better ways to approach certain behaviors. So throughout my, the years that I've been working with this agency and kids with disabilities, it makes me feel very fulfilled and accomplished when I see a certain client reach their goal for something and it just makes me very happy in my heart. And I feel like a, a place in my heart shining because I feel happy for them. Great job, Denise. Okay, so next up we have Jasmine. And Jasmine actually, Jasmine did a lot of work. She even went to get pickup shots with her dad on location after doing the interview. Um, uh, and it came together great. Jasmine, why don't you say hi? Hello everyone. My name is Jasmine Gary. I go to Downing High School. Being in this internship has taught me how to become a better communicator. And it also gave me a glimpse on what this, what it would be like to work in this profession. Um, at times I was frustrated, but with the help with Barb and Cassandra, my colleagues, they made my documentary better than I thought it was going to be. Um, so on that note, I decided to do a documentary on my father who had a terrible car accident. And basically, it allowed him to view the world differently. So I hope you guys enjoy. Great intro, Jasmine. I'm glad you overcame frustrations. It always pays off, and it does in this lovely film. Okay. You know, Jeremiah Gary, Jazz's dad, doing a documentary about my car accident back in 2011. I just remember that morning, um, Saturday morning, I was working at Metro at the time with the bus company. I just started as I was anxious, you know, to get the job there. So I overslept and I jumped up, got ready, just got in the car. I did speed a little bit, but when I got halfway downtown, I slowed down. But it was a sewer drain that was clogged and it was so high, it was high like an ocean. I remember a Cadillac drove by on the side of me to splash my car and I couldn't see, so it seemed like I was in the ocean driving. So I think what happened was how I panicked. Um, I remember when you make that right turn, there's a, there's a warehouse dock, and I always remember seeing all the trailers. So when I made the turn, I think it's a hydroplane. So when I was trying to hit the brake, it wasn't stopping. Then when I did the brake the last time, I think they said I hit a car. For my skin, I lost my hand. I shattered my shoulder, so I got plates right here. So actually, I have a plate right here. I have a plate right here. I have screws in place right here. So I went from a wheelchair, I had a walker, and I had a cane. And, and then that's when I did 
started back working. When I was going back and forth to the doctor, they said I wasn't, I wouldn't be able to work or walk again. And now I'm going on five years ago, I'm unified as a custodian in my home school's Doty Middle School. The funniest part was that um, during the injury, one of the nurses came by and they'll tell me about my mobile movement, I won't be able to walk that much like, or run or whatever. And I guess because I was laying down, they thought I was tall. And you know, I played pickup basketball with my cousins, but they thought I was trying to play professional basketball because they said, well, you, know, you can't play sports no more. You know, you're dreaming playing with Kobe. I said, no, I was playing with pickup games, you know. And I, at one point, I flatlined, I was gone. But the funny thing about that, I knew who I was because um, it seemed like I pictured myself in a capsule. And, you know, the little memes, you can see, like, it seemed like every time they was working on me, like layers of worry or um, hate, anything that was going on in my life was killing off me. And I felt refreshed. And once I got older and Jasmine came, my life changed to where I was trying to be, do for her. You know how they say, you want to do better for your kid and make sure everything worked out good. And you know, it was the ups and downs, but that's the way of life. Great job, Jasmine. Your dad seems like a really good man. Okay, so uh, our, our final film is by Isabella. And I just want to say that, that a lot of these are very personal. Isabella's is very personal. And I want to thank her parents for, for opening up about, about this uh, family story. And um, Isabella, why don't you say a few words? Hi, I'm Isabella. Sorry about the tuba. Um, I'm a senior at Warren. I'm an incoming senior at Warren. And uh, during the internship, I realized that making documentaries is hard work and takes a lot of dedication. And it taught me that if you enjoy your work, you will want to succeed. And if you want to succeed, you can succeed. What inspired me to make my documentary uh, about my baby brother whoa, is how he affected me and my family. And I thought his story could impact others in a positive way too. So I hope you enjoy my documentary. Thanks, Isabella. I kind of like the tuba. I think that was a sort of, all right, here we go. I don't know why it says it's an hour and 35. Let's see what happens. Yeah, there was a lot of anxiety uh, leading up to it, you know, because it was, we finally get to meet our baby boy, um, he, but he's only going to be 27 weeks, so we didn't know what lay ahead, and so when he was born and he was taken out of her, out of Yvette's womb, um, you know, he made these movements like he wanted to cry, but unfortunately because his lungs weren't fully developed, he couldn't let out that, that cry. Um, he had so many tubes and wires and monitors and everything's on his face and his hands. I mean, there was really, it was really hard to even see a clear patch of skin on him. He, yeah, yeah. He, he needed 24 hour uh, support. It was really critical, it, so much that they wouldn't even allow us to hold him that first week. Yeah. Um, it was miserable, just, I mean, not to hold your baby when they're born. And so as a mother, you know, I worry about, is he going to know that I'm his mom? Is he going to know that I love him? Yeah, surrounded by all these machines and whatnot. So that made me, you know, feel helpless in a way, too. The only thing I kept saying in my mind, if I could switch places with him, I would right now. That's the only thing I, I come up with, you know. He was born June 24th of 2020. And he passed away November 16th of 2020. That was like the hardest day. That, yeah, the saddest day. That was the hardest day in my life. Um, it dwarfs anything you think 
it's a problem in your life when you see your baby who is who's dying and you're you're helpless you, you can't help him you can't do anything for him you can't there's nothing you can do for him that's going to change his situation as I'm driving to the hospital there's this this hymn that comes to, to mind um, in Spanish it's called Mas Allá del Sol Mas Allá del Sol in English it's Beyond the Sun that song came on and generally that song is played at funerals most of the time brothers and sisters that pass away they request that song to be played and just out of nowhere that song starts playing in the back of my mind as I'm driving then I knew that at that point um, Avi wasn't going to make it I think that was God's way of telling me that you know he wasn't going to he wasn't going to get past that day because of the restrictions that were in place. Our kids were only able to meet their little brother as he was dying. You know, they said hello and they said goodbye all. All in the same breath. You know, that's something that I don't think a family should go through. It's hard for them to process. It's very difficult for them to process. I think the effect that it had on our family was it, it brought us a little bit closer together. Kind of maybe tore down a lot of distance because we all went through this together. We didn't, it wasn't they lost their child or, you know, it was we lost a child. You know, God has a plan for everyone. And for obvious, it, his life affected and really touched the lives of our family. And I know it was hard for them to process but I just hope that over time they can see what I see and obvious purpose in his life. Beautiful, Isabella. <sighs> can we just have a round of applause for all of these incredible films? Thank you so much for sharing of yourselves, for sharing of your families, for sharing of your thoughts and, and ponderings. So we have about 15 minutes left here and I would love to open it up to questions. Um, uh, I don't know if we have any on, on YouTube, June, maybe you could look at that, but, but John, you're in the room, Cody, or the other people who are, or even of each other, are there any questions? Thanks, Levy. Yeah, that was really powerful, Isabella. There was a question on YouTube. What's it, the question on YouTube? It was for uh, the film about the heels. So the question, sorry, I have to go back to the. And, and it would while, be, while you ask the question, Isabella does need to go back to band. So I'm gonna go ahead and let her go. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead, Isabella. Thank you so much. Thanks, Isabella. And then, and then yes, let's, uh, yeah, the question on heels. I have oh. a, Cassandra yes. wrote, Love the review of Heels. Why did Isaac choose this subject? Kind of explained it at the beginning, but Isaac, will you give uh, another? Uh... Yeah. Um, so I said how it was, it's like the topic is like underrated, but also um, I've always, I've recently been into fashion history and I've, I've seen how like there's, there's always like trends in fashion but like something that's always like stayed the same is like heels because women like throughout the decades they've worn like hats and gloves and even though like people still like they might wear that it's not very common but it's something that's always stayed as the heel and so I was like interested in that and then I learned that like it's usually um a woman who wears a heel but then when I learned I had to do my research it was actually men who wore them first which was surprising and so it was it was sort of interesting to like go back in time and just like learn about the history of heels and and yeah but yeah yeah that's cool no i love it you're just like huh so um cody did you raise your hand a little 
Yes, I just want to thank every student and including you, Barb, what a wonderful job all of you did. Every year I look forward to uh, just sitting here and listening to those wonderful videos. I mean, just the fact that a lot of them brought in their own personal uh, things, you know, and sharing them with us is amazing. Um, this last video just broke my heart. And, um, but I want to congratulate every single one of you because you've put a lot of your heart into it and a lot of thought into it. Thank you again for letting me be part of this. Thanks, Cody. John, yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, curious, what was the most surprising uh, discovery that any of you made while engaged in this project? What surprised you the very most? It's a great question. I'll give you a second before I start calling on some of you. Well, what surprised me for making this project was um, the amount of time it had to take to edit all of these interviews or videos or B-roll that we all had to do, especially most of us with narration. I think I can speak with for all of us that it's definitely took a lot of time, but we managed to have it at our own pace or try to have it in on time to show um, our friends and family and the rest of us our stories. But it was a very fun experience too. Thanks, Mariah. Who else, what, what surprised somebody else? I'll go. Um, something that I found really interesting, even just right now, I think I realized it was the common experiences I feel like we all share, even if it's not us personally, but I feel like a lot of us, especially in our diverse community, um, have parents who immigrated here, have stories of fun pets, crazy pets, uh, struggles with mental health. I know that I learned that. Um, and it's just like this common experience I feel like we didn't realize we had with one another, but through film, through storytelling, through filmmaking, we're able to realize that. And even if it is virtually and we didn't really even get to meet one another in person, I feel like I connected with all of you in some way or another. And I really appreciate that. It was really fun. That's great. Who, and anybody else want to share something that surprised them? Or I mean, did you come into it thinking one thing? And or I love the question, John. So who else had a surprising moment? Uh, I'll go. I think one that surprised me the most was like, uh, I don't know how it worked out for others, but for me, it's I feel like filmmaking is something that like you can't, um, you could plan for it, but it's not going to always go exactly how you plan because there's always things that you're going to maneuver, change, or it's so it's something you could like set up and you say, I want it this way, but it's not going to turn out that way because there's always things you have to fix and you could end up with something totally different but still get your point across. That's true, especially I'm not always like scriptive document with you. We had, Levy had a whole person that he was gonna interview who then, you know, canceled last minute and then he had to like pivot. So um, uh, yeah, great surprise. What about anybody else? No one surprised. Elizabeth, do you get surprised by anything? Besides me saying boo. <laughs> I got surprised by my mom. There is something that didn't make it into the documentary. There is, and things that she did say within the documentary, like I didn't know some things about her that when she was talking, I was just like, wow, that's very like inspiring. And those were sentimental, some things that she said. That's cool. Yeah, some of you had said that you, especially with your interviews, that the things were came up in interviews that you're like, I never knew that. Why would you? Andrea, how about you? Um, I think the interview, um, it really helped me connect to my dad a little more, uh, especially because, like, prior to this, I never took it upon myself to ask him such questions as like why he chose the United States or like how it was when he got here at first because he came by himself with no one like no one here who who he knew um and so it did i guess help me understand a little more of like where he came from and 
just connect with him a little more. And so I guess that was like the most surprising part of this experience. That's great. Anybody else? No, <laughs> you're like, no, don't call on me. Were there other questions? Oh, here's another question um, uh, from uh, uh, Cassandra. What did you experience? Oh, that's a good question. What did you experience that you feel gave you the most value or will stick with you for future jobs? It's a really good question, Cassandra. Um, I think how important communication is and like like how kind of like what Levy said about how things don't always go as planned. Um, communication is really key and like because life happens, you know, and you have to be able to maneuver and be able to communicate to like, for example, us with Barb, like what's happening in our lives and why certain things aren't being turned in on time or whether um we didn't get something done like it's it, it was just super important um for all of us i think to make sure we were speaking to barb and communicating and yeah yeah communication is key in any profession you know were you gonna say something Alyssa? i saw you like flicker over the no yeah, say something. I'm, I think one thing I'm going to take away from this is try something new because I've never made a film before. It's never something that's interested me. I've always appreciated movies. You know, I love to cry. I love to laugh during movies. But I think taking the time out of like my summer to just sit and make a film, it made me appreciate, I guess, the little things I took for granted, which are films, because I never really appreciated the amount of time, the amount of effort, the intricacy that goes into crafting something like this much less something that's like an hour too long, you know? And I think just trying something new, even if it is something that you've never experienced before, it ended up being one of the funnest months that I've had in a very long time and I'm really appreciative of it. That's awesome. How about you, Paul? What'd you learn besides the fact that I'm gonna harass you? Yeah, um, so I'd say that one thing I've learned was that probably the, I guess like the, like applying words, like, because from an interview, there, there is no script. Usually when we're working with, when I'm working with creating shots, I'm working with the script to create visuals, but working with an interview, which is kind of a new thing for me, is that I was able to mash it together and blend um, a lot of the phrasing to make a one complete story out of it. And putting time in, getting motivation to do that too was helped so much to like I guess process it and then I was very happy with how it came out and I very much will be applying that mentality to creating more story out of the words as well into my other projects. Good yeah it's a different kind of editing isn't it super super different from narrative. Um, how about you Jasmine what was something that that, that you might take from this to other jobs? Um, definitely communication. It goes a long way. Um, I know I communicated with you a lot and Cassandra and it benefited me. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the best thing. I love that early on when you're just like, hey, do you mind like taking it? And then I'm like, oh, do I? I'd love to, you know, like like people around and when you go into the, the workplace, there people want to help. And so sometimes you just gonna say, hey, this is where I'm at or I'm stuck on this and let us know. And then you, you did a great job with that. And you weren't even stuck. You're just like, hey, what's happening here? <laughs> um, and then you did a great job. Are there other questions or somebody else want to share? We have another couple of minutes. I have a question. Yeah, unless someone else wants to share. I'm just curious. First of all, congratulations. So it's out in the world what you created. I would love to get your your feelings of what it was like to watch your film. It was streamed live. If any of you want to share how that felt for you, I'd love to hear it. Oh my gosh, where to start? <laughs> um, so when I was making and editing the the film, my film, I was I was really happy that it came out like the way how I wanted to, and mostly with the help of with Barb and Cassandra. 
I definitely got a lot of help from them on how to arrange it and stuff. But when I saw it today, I felt I I felt like happy, but like emotional at the same time, because I didn't know how music can like really, um, how do you say, really um, get the emotion of the film. And so I was like, I kind of want to tear up of my own film, like even though I didn't tear up when I was making it, because I was just happy how it came together. And also watching everybody else's films, I was like tearing up on some of them and laughing on some of them. and. Yeah, it was, but it was really great after all. Music is emotional, right? Um, and as Isaac A knows, it also sets the time and tone in place. Who else, who else was like, was it just sort of like, oh, are you were even aware of it that, oh, it's streaming over there while we're sitting in here? Um, I was oh, after. Go ahead, Isaac Williams. Okay. Um, for me, it was, I was very, it was very self-criticizing. I, like whenever, like when it got to my turn and I kind of watched it, I was, I kind of would see things. I was just like, oh gosh, no, it's going to be bad. But um, I did finish it. I was very confident. I was very proud of what I did. And I guess that's just me. That's just my personality. I like to always judge what I do a lot. So, but I was definitely proud and happy to kind of see like, I did that. That was me. <laughs> So it was very fun. <laughs> that was you and you rocked it. And who else was about to speak? Me. Oh yeah, Denise, I'll, yeah. I was gonna say that at first I was really nervous because I had, I didn't know how to edit. And I was like, oh my God, is it gonna be too long? Is it gonna be, but with your help, I was able to cut it down. And the I was so happy with the final product because it was my first time. And it was just, it was just a really fun experience. That's awesome. You did a great job cutting it down. Your, 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 your rough cut was like eight and a half minutes. You got it down to just about five. Great job. And Mariah, you're nervous when you start streaming. Anybody else? No, so do we, um, uh, then oh, perhaps. I, I do want to just, so it is, it's one of those, yes, things can always be better. Yes, there's, there's that component. However, please celebrate. You did this in four weeks. Four weeks, okay? By yourselves, virtually. So please give, every, give each of you yourself a pat on the back because it's huge what you were able to accomplish in a very, very short period of time. And it's important to also celebrate because that's part of, our journeys as many of you, this was your first job. How many of you could raise your hand? How many of you, this was your first job? Um, wow. So you have now something that you can show what you made in a very short period of time. And please use this as you are applying for jobs, as you are applying, if you choose to apply to college this coming year, these are experiences that you could build from. Please just acknowledge your own accomplishment and, 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 and have that, that joy and that pride of what you created because it's really important. Again, this is one of those periods of time where we're in this crazy pandemic. You've been home from school for a very long time. You chose to do this internship. You chose to stick with it and you have a final product. So please, everybody, let's do another round of applause because it's huge. And before I leave, I just wanna say one more time, I am so proud of all of you. It was an honor to work with each and every one of you. I really loved our back and forth and talking about your films and getting to know you through the process. So thank you so much. Connect with me on the LinkedIn and the socials and I hope to see where you where you go next and what you do, okay? Hit me up anytime. And, and we're gonna continue celebrating just for everybody to know Friday, we're gonna celebrate with our intern celebration Friday at 10. And we wanna just acknowledge all of you with the 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 fact that barb and i and and all of us here at bay group we're really interested in staying connected with you over time this is something that that we want to build relationship and continue so we actually have another showcase that we need to do which is why we're going to end now and invite you to come and join your colleagues at the next showcase so 
So thanks everyone for watching on YouTube. Thanks everyone. Thanks John. Thanks Cody. Thanks everyone to for joining us. Wait, last shout out to Cassandra, our intern, who was an alum of the program last year, has been with us at Bayer Group since September. Cassandra, I'm just gonna please share with us how this was for you before we hop off because you're a huge part of this group. Yeah, no, I um, I really enjoyed this experience watching all of you guys start from nothing. A lot of you didn't even know what you guys wanted to do. You didn't know how to use software or anything like that. So to watch your guys' progress and see how far you came, knowing that I went through that at one point too, it was really emotional for me. And it's just, I'm really happy to see how far you guys came with it. And I'm really proud of all of you. So good job. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Thanks. we're going to hop off. Thank you, everyone. Bye.